I'm just going to introduce all of them for now on. So, hi everybody, welcome to SGSG. I'm Chris Schmidt. We're going to jump on into the chat room. And in the chat room, we had Matt Joe Will linking us over to this really neat Xbox uh, motion brand ident. Uh, was it created by... Yeah, okay, he's part of a, an in-house team at Man vs. Machine, so they do amazing work. This is from Simon Holman, Holmendel? Home, home metal. I don't know. I'm really bad at pronunciation of that kind of thing. But it's this really, really gorgeous uh, Xbox logo animating. So we're gonna try and tackle this. I don't know any. I don't know if it's gonna turn out well or not, or if we're gonna get anything kind of neat looking. Uh, I'm mostly interested in the technical side, but there are some like just really nice subtle color variations going on in here, and lots of you know, there's a lot going on. Uh, and then it kind of closes up right there. I am mostly interested in this kind of section, this motion that we're getting out of it, and to see if we could in any way get anything even remotely similar to that. So why don't we jump right on over in the cinema and start tinkering around. So here's my basic thought. My basic thought is you're going to take something, uh, I guess we'll do a star, we'll do five-sided so it's not an Xbox logo. So my basic thought is we're going to take something like the star, and I don't know how, how the polygons are subdividing, but I'm going to take a spherified deformer. I'm going to make it a... Actually, I'm going to group the star and then put the spherify in, inside there. And now I want to show you what we're looking at. Uh, we, have, we have to give it more poly, so I'm going to set this to subdivided, which just for demonstration purposes should be fine. So here's what I'm thinking. You see if the star is up here, it's actually pretty flat. And as I pull it backward through the spherify, actually the spherify by default is set to 50%, so we got to crank up to 100. So now if I move it over here, you'll see that we kind of get that one, you know, we kind of get this nice pinched star shape. And as I drag it back, it's going to expand out and actually flatten out to what should effectively be a perfect circle. And then it's going to shrink to the opposite side. And it actually, so if I just drag it, you see it's going to get quite tiny. So that actually gives us a lot, like a lot of that motion. Um, and I, I, to what, I wonder to what degree that they actually did it that way. Zoom. Um, but then there's, there's, some additional tricks to this, and here's where maybe I get a little bit more lost, is you'll see that these are all, like these are really nice curved shapes for one, so we'd have to figure out some rounding on our shape, which we probably can, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but you'll see that these actually are kind of lofted into the center of the object, and they're all doing these really beautiful curves as they go around, and that's the part I'm maybe a little fuzzy on. So here's, here's maybe my thought on that. If we were to copy that whole hierarchy and we take a second spherify and we set the radius to be small, smaller, you see we get a second little star down lower. They're actually still technically placed in the same spot as far as their null is concerned. So if we move these, they should kind of move in tandem. Zoom, zoom. So if we were to then take these guys and loft them... But, I, okay, we can't put the null in because that's not going to loft it. But if I feed this into a connect object, will it turn it into a spline? That is a big question for this. Connect, feed here. Okay, cool. The connect is indeed turning it into a spline that can be, we can feed it through that way. So I'm going to create two connect objects, put them both in here. They should have identical identical uh, point count, so they should match. Of course, the loft is the important part here. Uh, here's a weird quirk with loft, is you always have to have, it's it's this mesh subdivision that is the magic number. So you gotta do a little math on this. So we have five points, but then there's a point out and a point in, which means there's like at a minimum 10 points that we need. So we could type in 10, but it's gonna look really bad. What you actually always need to do is do one higher than you think you need, and you'll actually get this nice clean number. So by setting it to 11, you know, by always having it one higher than the number of points you think you need, you'll actually get the correct amount. Um, so let's say we want two points for it. We'd actually have to do 20, which is the original number, plus one. And that will actually be a nice even increment. We've got the same number of points on all the different sections. So we don't actually want any caps. So I'm going to say none, none. And I wonder to what degree... Uh, I don't think we need the curvature on the inside. If I go to a display mode where you can see our lines, you can see we have a bunch of depth on that. Uh, I don't think we need the depth. So in the loft, I'm going to drop that way down, and we have to turn off the checkbox per segment so we get rid of those. Maybe we need that, maybe we don't, but for now, let's just get rid of it because I don't think we do. And I think we probably actually do need quite a few more points traveling along this, so we have to increase that. So we have to go to our loft, and let's we could double it again. So it would be... 
20, which would be 40, or we could do 80. So we can do 80 segments around, which is plus one, which is 81. And now you see we get more of an even number, but it is perfectly divided. Like they should be kind of evenly matching left to right, side to side. They all have the same number of points. Um, so now having done that, we could maybe take this and throw it into a subdivision surface. Um, it's actually curving a little. It's curving a little there. I wonder to what degree we can get that sharpness. You see, it's very curved here, but not so much there. I wonder if we can control that via the splines placement. If I set this to none. Okay, it does turn quite even if we set it to none. So that is, I think, what we want. Something along those lines. So we've got our angle here. I'm going to crank that up to... Mm, we got all these subdivisions. Let's say 15. Maybe subdivide is just not what we were going to want at all. If I set this down to natural and start dropping these numbers down, it should start... Mm, I don't know, but... Having the subdivide is what gives us that curve, so that's kind of a tough, tough call there. I'm trying to determine, like, how these points are distributed. You see they kind of pinch up here and not so much there. But the fewer number of points we have up here, the more of a curve we will get out of our subdivision surface, but then it's going to be fighting down here. Uh, we, we could get really in-depth there, but let's just say that's close enough. We kind of get our arc there. Now what I'm curious about is how well, and let's keep in mind that these two stars are identical and they're in the same place. It's just the spherify that's changing them. So let's see if this gives us anything kind of akin to what we're looking for. So that's a neat shape where it actually does travel from one side to the other. Uh, very simply, not too bad. Um, now if we go and look at the piece, I think you'll see that there's... There's a lot more going on than just that, but uh, I want to see what happens if we start getting perhaps a series of these going. Uh, and I'm curious if there's any thickness to those. It does look like there is a little bit of thickness on those, so uh, we're probably going to be keeping it off most of the time. But if we go to our our simul excuse me, can we up there? Uh, simulate menu, grab a cloth nerd, don't subdivide, throw our whole subdivision surface in there, and uh, I missed, threw it in sub, in our claw surface, and now we can give it some thickness. Um, perhaps negative thickness, have it pull out just a little bit, um, so we can actually get some thickness back in there. It might be a good idea to reverse the order of our subdivision surface and our cloth surface. Do, do, so now it's smoothing that, but now you, you'll actually see it smooths out the edge, so I think actually it's, it is indeed this order we want. We might even go and put another you know, another subdivision surface to smooth it all out again after that. But you see that actually gives us the thickness, all still a parametric rig. So we can actually pull this through. It goes, okay, interesting, neat. Uh, there's some Fong weirdness. We can fix that with Fong tags. I'm not going to worry about that for right now. Uh, definitely some Fong weirdness. Whenever you don't have these sharp edges, that's uh, that's what happens. The cloth nerve's actually really bad about this. Ah, we'll fix it now because it's bugging me. Uh, I can make a connect object, hold down Alt, so it actually becomes a parent. Now you have to set that to manual and then put a Fong tag on that and then set that to limit the angle, and that's going to fix it. Uh, the cloth surface, uh, if you put Fong tags on it, it's like, I don't care. I'm not worried about Fong. So you actually have to put into a connect, which turns into kind of a virtual have, having made it editable, and now we can feed the Fong tag onto that. Uh, so I guess one of the challenges here is going to be getting a whole series of these going and seeing how that looks. So uh, I would love to use signal on here, but if we're going to use cloners, uh, cloners, we're going to offset time via cloners, and that can only do it if it's based off of keyframes, and um, signal is not based off of keyframes, although we can bake it. But I think for right now, it might just be easier to record keyframes. So uh, let's start out with it kind of tiny. Uh, I'm going to record on Z, and let's fast forward to the end. And I guess we can just type in the negative version of that number. It should be the opposite, and then we should be able to just rewind, hit play, and see what we get. Zoom! Uh, a couple things to note. I think just speed-wise, naturally, if we're moving that at an even speed, we're going to get that really speedy burst in the middle. And because when we're recording by default, it's set to spline, so you actually see our points are clustered up close in the beginning and then slow in the middle. So it's actually fighting us on that end as well. If we want to fix that right away, we can go to our window timeline, which we don't go into too often here. We actually, they separated them out. We can go straight into our F-curve editor. So we can go straight into F-curves, which is fine. And you'll see what's causing that. We have these two arcs. I get the letter 
uh, what letter? S. S will frame the selected. So you can see that we have an arc that's saying go slow, go faster, go slow. I think we actually want the inverse. If we have both of them selected, they'll do the same action but inverted. So if we, we actually want to do this kind of a curve. So we're saying go fast in the middle, in the beginning and end, but slow in the middle. The verticalness of this is translating to our speed. I'm actually going to dock this because we might go back to it. So uh, let's hit play. So don't see how the null is doing all this really quick motion? But if I deselect it and we ignore that and we just look at the X, it's actually moving at a pretty good speed. Like while our spline, while our actually stars, are, you'll see, are doing this kind of snappy zoom, zoom kind of motion. The X itself, it's actually compensating for the kind of the way it scales. It's all keyframe based, so with any luck, I'm going to turn off our connect and cloth and even potentially subdivision surface just for a while we're cloning it so it goes quick. I'm going to create a cloner, throw this guy into the cloner. We actually do want it to be linear, but we don't want them to move in space. So what we actually have right now is three clones all in the exact same spot doing the exact same thing. We're going to actually want a bunch of these. I'm going to set it to 10 for now. Um, our poly count with all those other checkboxes being off is actually quite reasonable. So let's start with that. Um, so now we do the magical set thing, which is going to be offsetting them via time. And I'm going to do that in the most simple way, which is using the step effector. So I got the cloner selected, grab the MoGraph effector step effector. And that's going to make each clone kind of go in step by step by step. We're going to want this to be linear. So we've got this spline, but you can see that it has a nice smooth arc to it. So I'm going to click on the window, hit Command or Control A, right click, and go spline type linear. So now it's a straight line. You see these are all linear. Each one's getting affected an equal amount more than the previous one. So what do we want to affect? Well, by default, it's set to scale. Scale, but we actually want to affect it by time. I'm going to offset by five frames. I'm not sure if that's overall or individual, but let's just see what that gives us. Okay, it's, I think it's overall, so we're going to have to put a lot more in there. So let's start stretching this out. Actually, I'm going to go to the middle of our animation, and let's just pull this to a certain point and see what we end up with. Uh, okay, cool. We're actually getting a really nice kind of patterning going. We might even have too many of these guys, uh, or we can really start spreading out the time a little bit more. And let's just see what we're looking at here. I'm going to change their display mode so we're just we're not seeing the lines. Also, the spherifies are bugging me, so I'm going to hide them. They're still there. So play and let's see what we get. Nope, 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 nope. Uh, not too bad. We need more frames because we're offsetting our time, so it's eating up more timeline. Hit play. It's actually working incredibly well. It's working better than the last time I tried to tackle this. So that's pretty neat looking. Um, now what's cool is we have a completely parametric setup going on right here. So we can say grab our smaller sphere phi, which is this one. I can actually set the radius down to zero. Okay, apparently not zero, but I can set it to one. If we set our setting down to one, then these will actually sweep down to the very zero point. I actually kind of like it better the other way. Maybe we'll go to 50. So we get that hole in the middle, but they're still going down most of the way. So those can be all spreading out to the opposite side. Very nice. They're all tiling up and layering quite nicely. Um, and then we can start messing around with some other things. We got our cloner. Uh, so those are all spreading out very evenly right now. So this should be a kind of constant rate. They're all kind of spread out very evenly. Um, if we were to, and I guess, well, I think they should just work. But you see, if we turn on all of our different settings, it's going to be running a lot slower. Actually, it's not terrible. Um, you know, we can have this here with the thickness and it's working pretty well. Zip, 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 zip. Uh, neat, neat, looking pretty good. Not amazing, but pretty good. Um, something I would love to see here, and I don't know if it would work. Um, well, we, I want to see some scale variation here. And I guess we could just straight up in the cloner. I'm curious, but let's go ahead and just put a random effector on here. Don't want position, but we do want scale. I'm going to say a uniform scale. Let's just add this in. And actually, I'm going to say absolute and go negative. So they can only go ever go smaller. So we've got all of those stacked in, but they're randomly getting scaled down. So you'll see that we have some smaller ones in there and some larger ones. It's actually working pretty well. Uh, that's not too bad. Um, there's some visual kind of... Because they're not starting out infinitely small. Like We always see the big one down there, so we'd have to work around that. Just adding that little... That little bit of randomness like that's actually working pretty well. Uh, as an alternative, we could actually throw in a second step effector. In fact, why don't we just copy and paste this step effector? 
Uh, we're going to call this one step time. And we'll call this one a step scale. Uh, and now, of course, we have to add it to the cloner. So we'll go to effectors, add it in here. So the time or the step, this one's turned off, but now that the step is double timing. So let's do a time offset of zero because that's already taken care of. And let's do scale. Uh, so now we're saying that it's changing scale over the arc of this. We want to be an absolute scale and let's pull it down. So we go to maybe half the size. So what we're saying is each, like, so this is actually gonna go from the, it's gonna make tiny ones and then go bigger, 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 uh, which is kind of neat. Um, but we can now go over to the spline and have very specific control over it. So I actually want these to be soft. I'm going to set point types to soft. And now I'm going to grab this point, maybe drag it up to the top. And let's start out big. And then we're going to arc down medium size. And then we'll go back bigger again. And then we're going to go really small. And let's be small for an extended period of time. Keep in mind, the very bottom of this is going to equate to... 50%, so half size. So even when we go maximum down, it's only 50% of it. So now what we should see is big. They're going to get a little bit smaller. They're going to get bigger again. And then we're going to get these smaller guys all clustered up. So we can kind of control the arc of that, like, you know, kind of artistically direct how how those are transitioning. Now, with this being an entirely parametric setup, let's keep in mind that we have a lot of options as far as adding additional clones. I think as we add more, you see they're just going to get pinched tighter together and that's because the time step is based on the global amount it's taking this 157 frame offset and no matter how many we feed in it's going to take that 157 frames it's not adding more frames on top um so it just pinches them together which even kind of stylistically here you'll see you know the more pinched that they are the more we're going to kind of see that clean transition um so that's kind of neat looking. Like, you know, we're getting this really nice peeling away. So that's how working actually incredibly well. Having more of them, I think, is, is adding to it. Uh, I'd say one of the biggest things right now is we're seeing the star at the beginning and end. And I think we probably maybe want to see it disappear. Also, keep in mind, this is all still parametric. So we could always, like, increase the number of stars. Of course, we'd have to recalculate our loft nerve, But let's not worry about that. I'm just, just going to leave it at five. Um, so... Uh, two potential options. One would be we want these stars to fly a lot further left and right when they start out, which we can actually see if that works. I'm going to go right into the star, and we've got the amount right here. I can actually just type in, let's put a zero on it. So I'm just going to add a zero to the end so it becomes instead of 400, 4,000. And you'll see at 4,000, it's a lot tinier, uh, which is which is fine. That might be what we want. Um, and then we grab the end one, which is right there, and we'll have it go to positive 4,000. Uh, now, we still have that big sweeping speed arc in there. Let's see how this gets affected. Um, once we start seeing, it's going to be slow starting out, but once we start getting, seeing them shoot out, okay, it's quite quick. You'll see that that midpoint is very, very fast. We're kind of losing it. Um, so that was kind of one option to do that. So I'm going to undo and not have these fly out to kind of super duper far left and right. And let's instead try and tackle, is this all correct now? Yeah, okay, uh, let's try and tackle this instead by animating the stars themselves. So what we're going to say is, uh, it's kind of hard to tell. Let's do this all just with one. I'm going to turn off the cloners so we just have our one. This is our base. So it, it's almost like it doesn't become real until like right around here. So let's say 10 frames in, it is these two radiuses. And that means 10 frames before the end, which will be frame 80, it is also still this. But at the very beginning... It's going to be a radius of zero and an inner radius of zero, which means it's going to transition. It so starts at zero and it transitions in quickly and then kind of smooths itself out. And then at frame 80, the keyframes aren't displaying here kind of correctly, which is just a weird quirk. It might have to actually, this is a, something that's a pain in the butt. Because I have these objects, so, no, that, that actually doesn't make sense. Maybe it's the parameters I've selected. Because this only has the position selected here, the timeline is corresponding with what I currently have selected. So uh, you'll see that my keyframes aren't showing up right there. So I'd actually have to deselect this, and it'll actually show everything. It's a pain in the butt thing that happens with the timeline. Uh, I, I'm not in the timeline super often enough to actually worry about the, uh, well, I can never remember, but there, there are settings in here where we can go to edit. I don't remember. Somewhere here, there's, there are functions where we link 
Like I, right now we're in automatic mode and that might be stopping us, but somewhere like here we're linking timeline to object manager selection, which is kind of fine. Um, link view with preview range, link view with object manager. I don't know. There's like a certain combination here where I think that won't happen, but I can never remember what it is. But in any case, you'll see that we are going from zero up to its normal size and we're going back to its normal size. And then we want to, at this time, go back to zero. So go zero, zero, record like some nice frames. Uh, so now, with any luck, we should see it kind of be zeroed out up here and then flatten out, disappear. So they might, they, like, because of these kind of extreme arcs we have, we might, you know, you see it kind of goes in and then slows down. We're not getting a very smooth motion out of that right there. Like, it's like, kind of goes fast and then slow before it does its big motion. And it's because we have two different arcs fighting each other. And let me just make sure that the live stream is still going. Yep, da, da, da. Lag. Everybody says everything's lagging. Hopefully it's not me. Uh, I'm going to have my other computer do a internet speed test because I can't even get it to come up. Uh, internet speed test. I did, I did a test right before I went on, and we were getting really good speeds. Lag fest started. Yeah, I'm sorry, everybody. Uh, begin test. Uh, but -ba down. That speed test doesn't look like it's going super quick over there. We'll have to see. Uh, I'm just gonna plug on through because we can still have this recording up on YouTube if it comes out well. So uh, I'm gonna hit play. Okay. Oh, anyway, so we've got these arcs and they're pinching. Uh, and we're getting this little speed slow down there. So there's a couple of ways we can maybe fight against that. If we go and we grab our two stars, you can see where these arcs are happening and how these kind of smooth out and then shrink down. And that's actually where one of the some of the problems are happening is that these keyframes are this arc never stops, but these do. So uh, something we could potentially do is we gotta kind of carefully grab those. This can be a little bit of pain. I'm gonna make sure I grab only these arcs and grab these, and I can. Um, which button will this be? I always forget. I'm just going to start clicking these because I can never remember which one I want. Uh, if I start clicking... Nope, these are all zeroed out. Right now we can... It's not break tangents. We want the... Uh, why are they zeroing out? I can never remember these well enough. One of these buttons here, that one kind of did it. Uh, certain combinations of these buttons are going to give us a soft arc. Uh, which actually isn't working as well as I would want it to. Um, custom auto classic. Nope. Auto weighted. Nope. Custom. I mean, we could set the custom, but I don't want to do that either. Don't remove over. Oh, okay. Well, let's see. Even that helped. So we got. If we expand this, you can see we got uh, our and we we get this dialog by grabbing these frames. Um, I'm going to remove overshooting, and you'll see that they can actually arc. And you see they're actually arcing the entire way, which would help. In addition to that, I can actually grab these guys and start scooting them in towards the center so that like, this motion gets more smoothed out. Uh, so I move those to frame 30, so I'll move these into frame 60, so those are equivalent. And now you see we get a nice cleaner arc, so the motion never really stops, which should hide this a little bit more. Like, you're not really going to feel that speed transition as much. Um... Let me go make sure again. Okay, it looks like I'm back online, so hopefully we're all good. So, okay, that's working well. We got a nice arc, and they're completely disappearing, which I think is going to make everything look better. So if we turn our cloner back on, you'll see that these are actually kind of appearing out of nowhere now. So we're not always seeing the older ones. So we're actually getting a n much, much nicer flow on those. This is actually working almost what I think is pretty dang close, actually, to, to what is actually happening in our reference. So that's actually pretty cool. I'm quite happy with that. Uh, I feel like that's the meat and bones of this. Uh, let's maybe talk. I, I don't really care too much about it sealing in at the end because I feel like this was kind of a complicated, neat part, and it's coming out a lot, a lot better than I thought it would. Um, so uh, let's just talk about the last thing, which could be maybe the color. You can see there's a lot of really nice color variation here. So why don't we try and address that? So um, right now, this isn't a cloner, but there's no textures through here. So I think the cloner is still open to completely take over the color. So why don't we... Yeah, I'm going to copy this step scale, and I'm going to change it to step color. We never use a step 
very often, and now it's being super useful. So of course we need to add it, and what is it going to do? Well, it's not gonna do the scale, it's going to do color mode. So uh, the color mode that's always worked on pretty well for me is to turn on user defined, set the color to black, turn on alpha strength, and I think that will give us a perfect spectrum from black to white, but usually we're using, say, the random effector, and it's randomly pushing from black to white. Uh, so we don't want to be randomly pushing from black to, well, it's not randomly because we're using a step effector. What it's actually doing is this gradient transition. So let's see if this is actually going from black to white. It's actually hard to tell. I'm going to set this to linear for a second. And what that should mean is all these guys in the beginning are white. And as it goes further and further and further, it's going to get darker and darker and darker until the very last one is black and every transition in between. So that does mean this is indeed working perfectly. So we can start out white and then uh, let's go Let's go all the way to black, and then why not? All the way to white, and then we go all the way to black again. Uh, that's all fine with me. Maybe I'll grab a second point here and kind of level that out so we get that holding. So we got a couple little transitions going in there. So it will be dark, and you see it transitions in the light, and then it's turning dark. By having these little bit longer, well, you know, like having a good kind of transitional time, it's actually a little boring having it ever level out, so I'm going to not level it out. Uh, you always kind of want to see a little variation between the the one that's at and the next one is going to be on, I guess. Um, so you see it's nice and dark, but it, it's not until it starts transitioning that kind of is visually interesting. So you get a bunch of dark ones in a row and they might not be as interesting. So that's cool. That gives us the black to white color, but now we want to go into our material and let's do a nice orange color, I'm thinking. In fact, why don't we go extra fancy? I'm going to... Yeah, we'll do it in the color channel. But let's set up a scene. Since this is looking pretty good, why don't we give this an environment? And this, this is floating over a floor, so why don't we even try and do something along those lines? Uh, in fact, you can kind of... I, I feel like you can kind of clearly see that there's like a psych going on here, so why don't we do that? Um, in fact, uh, I'm going to steal a psych from Light Kit. So if we go into Light Kit... I can go into Sykes and just steal this big old Syke, boom. Uh, which at the end of the day is just a plane, but you know you just bend the bend the plane or sweep a spline, and boom, you've got your you've got your studio. I'm gonna hit T for scale and make this guy super big. You can never make a studio too big. Pull it down, pull it forward. Excellent. So now we've got our studio. Maybe even not quite so far down. Let's move it back forward. Let's see, I think Twitch might be having problems. Sorry, everybody. Uh, because my speed test is saying that it's actually pretty good. We're getting pretty good speeds here, so it's not me. But we are recording. So apologies, but I guess we'll just have to see what happens. Uh, oh, I was also going to throw in a nice HDRI studio, which we will steal our render settings from. I'll just immediately take GI medium high. And we will take, we'll open up our browser. We go for something a little crazier, maybe a little more abstract, or even go with a studio. Um, like, since we are kind of setting this up like it's an indoor setup, like it isn't indeed an indoor studio. I mean, you can't beat some of these nice basic ones. Let's take Basic Studio 2. We don't want the background, we don't want the floor that's taken care of by our psych. Um, so that should give us some nice colors. It should give us the ability for this to reflect. Yeah, my internet speeds are great. So if you're hearing me at all, it's Twitch doing this and not us, uh, as far as I can tell. So uh, we can go into our nice material here, and we're going to go into the color channel. I'm going to make a colorizer right away. And inside of that, I'm going to put a MoGraph color shader. And what's being fed into that color shader is our black to whiteness, which we set up via our step color. So now we can actually, well, this actually gives us some nice oranges already. So I'm actually going to just steal them from there. So we've got our oranges. I'm going to right click and say distribute knots, which just jumps it from left to right, it's just a little bit shorter. That's great, I'm gonna, actually that, that could be all we want right there, that's gonna colorize this black to white. We of course need to apply it to the cloner, and now it should actually gives us those transitions. And let's go into, oh why not, let's jump into top coat, uh, just so I can very quickly replace our default specular, um, Grayscale Gorilla top coat, um, just in case people aren't familiar with what it is. Uh, and why don't we go with something nice and shiny, we'll just click on wet, uh, which I, I think, I think wet is not blurry at all, and having it not blurry at all will just make everything render a little quicker. Wet, no blurriness, no roughness. So this should be just nice and shiny. It should catch our HDRI. We can actually, 
Actually, a, a, a definite additional detail that's happening here is you'll see that our overall shape is moving around to random orientations. And what's cool is we can actually totally use Signal for that. Um, we're just using a bunch of Grayscale Grill plugins. Um, so we already talked about keyframes, so I'm not going to be shy about using some, some Signal here. So anyway, I'm going to right-click, Add Signal. Now I grab the cloner. I'm going to throw the rotation parameter onto Signal. And now we can feed it some noise. And we want to randomly rotate, oh, let's even say up to 90 degrees on every axis. Uh, let's just hit play and see how quick that is. It could be quite fast. OK, this is very fast. So we're going to slow that down to like 0.25. Excellent. Now we're going to get some nice random rotation where this should be. Uh, actually, with all stars, it's kind of hard to see. But you can see with our arrow that it's actually rotating pretty well. Uh, I feel like the speed's pretty good, but maybe we can even push this to be like, you know, 160-ish. Just a little more, a little more motion there. And of course, we can keep trying different random seeds. So we got this nice color transition, kind of this big explosion of things happening. I feel like, uh, at least in here, before we get to the ending, actually, you see these arcs don't go that far down. Or maybe they, maybe they change over time. Those could also be, that could be an animated parameter. Um... At the end, when that seals in, it's actually just that last one slowly transitioning out. So that actually works pretty well. Uh, I'm not going to stress out about that part. We're just going to kind of leave this guy being all nice and cool and starry and blobby. Uh, let's hit pause and hit render. And let's see if we get some nice shine on this thing or not. Um, we do have GI on, um, which actually could completely kill... It could completely kill the uh, render time, which it does seem to be slowing us down a little bit. Um, something, a trick I've been enjoying doing is actually turning off GI entirely and then just completely depending on our our reflectance to do this. So I'm going to go into our color channel. I'm going to copy the colorizer, turn off our color channel, go into reflectance. And heck, uh, I'll just grab this wet material, copy it, paste it. And now this bottom one, I'm going to go to the color channel, the layer color, and paste the channel I copied, and that's going to now take on the colors. Um, we actually do a couple different ones here. If we change to something like Fong, uh, let's turn off the top channel. Uh, I think with actually you, have to, you do have to crank up the roughness, but uh, you know, we're starting to get, get the color channel coming through here. This will actually be kind of weird looking, but I think. But look how quick that renders! Like we got rid of the GI, and now it's rendering quick. Um, so even here with the second wet, uh, like we made this other duplicate of it manually. But if I crank up the roughness. With Fong being the type, you'll see that we're going to get something that should be... Did I, did I do something wrong? It's showing up, but not very... Not not too much. It's quite quite dull. Uh, I guess we could actually kind of fake it just by cranking up our reflection strength there. And this is actually just straight up reflecting, but it's reflecting based on a Fong model, so it starts seeming very dull. Um... GGX, would that do a little better job? I feel like we, I feel like we should get, be getting more color out of this. Not sure what I'm doing wrong, uh, but uh, all's well that ends well. So we're going to just try maybe that model, crank it up. I guess our psych is not generating any color, so this is only where it's reflecting from those other spots. So that might not be wrong. But now we can also turn on our wet channel, which is going to overlay on top of that. And now you'll see that we should get. Um, let's not worry about the psych for right now, but you'll see that we're actually getting like all the detail we would have been getting from the GI plus reflectance and we're getting it just via reflectance uh, and the render remember before is like the little box and it's taking forever to move and now it's rendering quite quickly and it's all reflectance based so if you go all if you go no color channel you can actually the reflectance isn't that bad uh, I feel like we just need more bling uh, and also our psych is going to have to turn into a similar type material so we're going to have to add a uh, I'll just add maybe a Beckman. Lots of roughness. Speculars are not doing anything, so it doesn't matter if you turn that on or off. Um, so anyway, that should kind of be white now. Let's see if that actually shows up. It, it is. You see, that's all just reflection-based um, coloring, which in reality is a lot. You know, that's closer to real life than you know. In real life, there isn't a color channel or a reflection channel. They're the same thing. Um, so that's working pretty well. Oh, the garbage truck's here, everybody. Everybody loves when the garbage truck shows up. Uh, so that's working pretty well. Let's make sure that our HRA studio is positioned in such a place. It's, uh, it's actually right here in the center, which isn't surprising. Let's hide the cloner for a sec. Let's just see where our studio is. Here's a preview. Uh, it's actually kind of set up pretty well. Let's have the warmth over there. 
Uh, neat. Now let's hit render, make sure that our lights are, are picking up well enough. Uh, if somebody's in Twitch, can you go check maybe some other channel, like have another channel in the background and see if, it, if Twitch is being bad or if it's just me. But in any case, I'm still recording. You'll get to see it online. Uh, so that's, this is working. This is working great. Um, I feel like there's a little bit of a softness here that we're not getting. There's definite ways to potentially get that. We could do a bunch of things. Actually, we can. I'm gonna hit N G. I'm sorry, N Q. N Q is a shortcut to hide textures. So now that's all reflection. It all turns black, which isn't helping us at all. So I'm just gonna turn off textures entirely, and now we can go back to our nice black to whiteness. Uh, we could pick a nice angle. You know, maybe something a little bit lower here, looking up at it. We can zoom in a little. Uh, but anyway, let's look at the curve. I'm going to create a camera so that becomes that. Now I won't lose that position. So if we want to maybe get a nice little bevel going out of here, we can actually do, just do that, maybe even parametrically. That starts making everything run slow, so it might not be the best choice. But I'm going to grab our bevel. I'm immediately going to turn on Use Angle so it doesn't try and bevel everything. And let's just throw this. I guess we'll grab our cloner, hit Alt-G so it's grouped, and I'll put the bevel inside of that group. Uh, okay, there's definitely, it's doing a great job of beveling these edges, but it's giving us some, let's see, well, first of all, it's running crazy slow, so it's not, it's not going to be a very viable option, uh, and it's also somewhere the polygons are pinching in a way that's making the bevel explode in these random directions, so that's not helping us, so I'm going to go ahead and kill that, and let's try and approach this from a different way. Uh, my next thought is, let's hit NB so we can actually see our polygons. And you'll see this is actually what we're dealing with here. If we turn off our cloth nerves for a second, you see that these are our polys. Not too bad. Um, my bevel, my, uh, my, my camera movement is being, behaving kind of oddly. It's grabbing the background but not this object. I'm not sure why that would be the case. Um, but uh, let's not worry about that. Um, or I'll just deal with it. So, uh, here, anyway, here's my thought. If we, if we can kind of have the proper polygon count here, then our subdivision surface should kind of deal with all of this for us. So if we go back to our loft, remember we were talking about these, the number of subdivisions kind of traveling up the shape. If I start increasing that to this higher number, you'll see that we'll kind of get, you know, there's, there's just straight up more polygons being dealt with here. We can turn on our cloth and that adds our thickness, which is great. And maybe even we want a little more thickness, so let's do that. Um, but now that whole thing, I mean, we're going to be getting up to quite a poly count here, but if we make another sub, you know, uh, subdivision surface here, we can even make the entire cloner be put in there. It's going to be doing the subdivisions. Actually, I think that will break all the materials, so we do have to do it in the hierarchy. So I'm going to do it inside. The connect is going to be put in here. And I'm just going to subdivide by one right now. Um, but what will happen is we get this nice even poly count traveling around this entire thing. Um, and you'll see that that's going to, you know, just do a nice subdivision, a nice little hypernerve curve on the edges, um, uh, because our bevel wasn't, uh, cooperating very well. Of course, you'd want that to be a little bit higher. Uh, we'd want this to maybe render at two so that that becomes a little bit smoother on the edge. If, if that's something we want at all, but I can go back to maybe this camera angle. Let's go to a nice frame like that hit render and see what this is doing for us it's very kind of dark inside of here there's so many different textural approaches we might be able to do with this um in fact something that might be good is if we go back into this material we can actually maybe kill off that one yellow there and I think I still have that one thing copied. If we go into the luminance channel and just paste this into the luminance channel then now it's going to be luminant with reflections on top of it, which is going to kind of, you know, it's giving us a super bright, vibrant thing, which is actually pretty cool. I li I'm liking the look of that. And if on top of that, we were to say, eh, do we, well, I'm going to do ambient occlusion. My question is, do we do global ambient occlusion or just this texture? Why don't we do global? So I'm going to go to our render settings, command or control B is going to pop that open for you. Uh, I'm just going to turn on ambient occlusion. I think by default these settings are set up to a little bit higher than the cinema's default. You'll see that our cube is about 200. Um, so I'd say that 200 seems like a pretty good number here. Maybe even 300. So I'm going to set the, our ambient occlusion to that. Uh, that might start taking a little while longer because of our... It's physical renderer. It's actually doing a pretty good job of it. So now you see we get kind of all of that light, all that illumination is working great. Um, but they still reflect each other and they're still reflecting the sky. 
So we get those nice, brilliant highlights. And overall, that just looks a lot better than it was using GI and then faking. Uh, using GI, it was really slow. Using faked reflectance or using reflectance to be the color channel as well wasn't giving us kind of a nice vibrant scene because the light couldn't get inside. So now we're just using a luminance channel and letting that kind of deal with itself that way. So it's all looking pretty good. Uh, actually, I'm quite I'm quite happy with the look of that. Uh, look, we're going, going to get this nice orange reflection down there because it's luminant, which actually, I don't mind that. Um, we'd probably want to go and make that psych material some, some sort of color that's compatible with our background, which might be somewhere in the yellow range. Maybe a little... Um, always got to be careful. If you go too far with yellow, it starts going in the green, and that doesn't uh, help anybody. Um, but uh, let's just go ahead and hit... Right. Actually, why don't I, just for the sake of seeing it, I'm going to just crank my subdivision surface up another one here, just for it to do a quick still and see how good that looks in this. Um, and it, this, obviously the second layer is automatically adding some really nice glints on the edge. We got almost like a subsurface scattering kind of vibe because we're using a luminance channel. Um, but of course it's not taking any of that calculation time. Uh, it's echoing out our yellow in the background. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what would be a good color back there. It's all working pretty well. Um, so I can set that up to do an animation, but uh, I think this is a good place to wrap it up. All the key things have been hit there. I'm going to go ahead and save this into... Oh, but you got to be careful because now with all these things on, it's going to be running very slow in the viewport. So it's just like when it comes time to kind of preview things, I can just turn off some of those slow things and hit play. And we're going to get very nice feedback, very good playback there. So you just got to remember to turn these things on and off depending on what you want to happen. So I'm going to go ahead and save this into uh, the folder... Um, let's see, we'll call it Star Sphere. Yeah, sure, Star Sphere. Star Sphere. Uh, and that one should wrap this one up. Thanks for the question, and I'll see you in another Ask GSG. Bye.